Hey guys, Matt here today getting back into Hebrews 1 and we're still on verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. We talked about this a little bit last time. We looked at the parable of the tenants in Mark 12. And how the author here is trying to shake up the Hebrew audience. He's saying, don't you remember long ago? Remember long ago when God spoke to our our fathers through the prophets? And it, it it's almost like in, in modern evangelicalism, we we might be tempted to look at that verse and say, oh, that was that was a fond memory. And oh, those were good days, but they weren't good days. They were terrible days. Terrible days. We looked at that in Hosea. What do we see in Hosea 1, 1 through 9? We see God tells Hosea to marry a whore and have children of whoredom. Name the first one Jezreel because God's going to sow destruction on Israel. He's going to break her bow, which is a, a way of saying, I'm going to defeat her. I'm going to break her in half. Have a, have a daughter and then name your daughter no mercy because I'm not going to have mercy on you at all. I'm not going to forgive you at all. Have a third child, a second son, and name him no, uh, not my people because I'm not your Yahweh and you're not my people. The worst of the worst names, not my people. A direct reversal of I am. I am your Yahweh. I am your God. In fact, if you remember, I think it's Exodus 4.22, uh, God calls Israel his son. And here, essentially, in Hosea 1.9, what God's doing is rescinding the name son to Israel. And then he's going to give that name to his only begotten son. We'll get there in a couple of verses. But, but here's the big idea. Here's the, here's the pace that the Hebrew author is setting. He's saying, guys, you remember you remember the problem with our forefathers. They never listened. I'm going to give you one more example of that. And then I want to look at a very important question. A couple important questions. Why is it that Israel never listened? And why is it that there's so many darn stories in the Bible? Why all this, uh, the, 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 the prophets, the major prophets and the minor prophets, and the story is always the same? Warning, stop sinning, Israel. Israel doesn't do it because she can't. We'll get there in a minute. God disperses her. God punishes her sin with sin. He takes sinful people and, and crushes them, disperses them, defeats them. And then there's, at the end, at the tail end, there's always this promise of restoration. But that promise was never for that generation. It was for when Jesus comes. It was for the day of the Lord. So, let's look at one more example and then we'll, we'll kind of unpack this, what, the whys and the hows and what was really going on. So, long ago, many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets and it wasn't good. It was never good. Let's look at one more passage and then we'll look at this uh, in more detail. Ezekiel 16. In Ezekiel 16, the first 11 verses, God finds Israel. I'll just start in verse 6. And when I passed by you, I saw you wallowing in your blood. He saw Israel helpless, in bondage. I said to you in your blood, live. I said to you in your blood, live. Verse 7, Ezekiel 16. I made you flourish like a plant of the field, and you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed, your hair had grown, Yet you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again, I saw you, and behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made you vow to I made my vow to you and entered to a covenant with you, declares the Lord. Then I bathed you and I clothed you and I wrapped you in fine linen and I adorned you with fine ornaments. I put bracelets around your wrists. I put rings in your nose, he says. And what did Israel do? Verse 15, But you trusted in your beauty and played the whore. Because of your renown and lavish whorings on any passerby, your beauty became his. Israel became a spiritual whore, giving her spiritual worship to anyone who would have it. 
You took some of my garments and made for yourself colorful shrines, and on them you played the whore. Now listen to this. The like has never been, nor ever shall be. She was a whore like no other whore. Verse 20. You took your sons and daughters, whom you had borne to me, and these you sacrificed to the false gods to be devoured. Were your whoring so small a matter that you slaughtered my children and delivered them up as an offering by fire to them? And in all your abominations and whorings you did not remember the days of your youth, when you were naked and bare and wallowing in your blood. This is the common theme. Israel gets rescued by Yahweh. She comes into prosperity. She starts worshiping the Baals, other gods. In fact, she takes the blessings and gives the blessings to the other gods. It's horrible. Uh, listen to this, verse 25. At the head of every street you build your lofty place and you made your beauty an abomination, offering yourself to any passerby and multiplying your whoredom. You also played the whore with the Egyptians, your lustful neighbors, multiplying your whoredom to, provide, to provoke me to anger. Behold, therefore I stretched out my hand against you and diminished your allotted portion and delivered you to the greed of your enemies. God always punishes sin with sin. The daughters of the Philistines, listen to this, who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. The daughter of the Philistines were ashamed of your lewd behavior. You played the whore also with the Assyrians because you were not satisfied. Yes, you played the whore with them, and yet you still were not satisfied. You multiplied your whorings also with the trading land of Chaldea, and even with this you were not satisfied. Her sin, her adultery, her idolatry was insatiable. It was growing. Verse 30, How sick is your heart, declares the Lord God, because you did all these things, Listen to this, the deeds of a brazen prostitute. Not just any prostitute, a brazen prostitute, it gets worse. Building your vaulted chamber at the head of every street and making your lofty place in every square, yet, listen to this now, yet you are not like a prostitute because you scorned payment. Adulterous wife who receives strangers instead of her husband. Men give gifts to all prostitutes, but you, you were such a whore that you gave your gifts to your lovers, bribing them to come to you. This is just a horrible picture. A horrible picture. So what does God do? God repeatedly divorces entire generations of Jews. Now this, this is something that sometimes people don't see or maybe they don't want to see, but it's very important to see this. It's very important for the book of Hebrews. It's also very important that we don't get uh, puffy about it because we would do the same thing if we were in her shoes. God does divorce generations of Jews. And you say in your, in your mind, you say, well, wait a minute. Yahweh made a covenant with her, and that's true, and he never broke it. But she did repeatedly, so eventually, after warning after warning, God has to do what he says he's going to do, and he revokes his marriage. He gives her a, a certificate of divorce. This happens repeatedly. Now, what does this have to do with Hebrews? It has everything to do with Hebrews, because the Hebrew author is saying, guys, don't you remember? Don't you remember how our forefathers never, never listened? Don't you remember that? And now the son comes the Son is here, Jesus Christ. Do not turn your back on Him. So as we look at this, one thing you may be wrestling with is, okay, why did Israel never listen? Why did most of Israel rebel? What was going on? Well, in Deuteronomy 29.4, Moses gives us the answer. Moses is uh, renewing the covenant, and he says something in verse 4 in chapter 29. He says, But to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand, or eyes to see, or ears to hear. Israel couldn't follow God because she didn't have a heart to follow God. It was terrible. God only saved a remnant to keep his line going. In fact, if you think, if you look in... Romans 11, which is quoting uh, 1 Kings 19, 
uh, verse 15, 16, something like that. Uh, it's, you know, the story where, where Elijah is complaining to God and he says, Oh, Lord, take my life. There's none left. In fact, let me read it real quick. This is an interesting passage. It's, it's Romans 11. And it goes something like this. Lord, they have killed you. This is Elijah speaking. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But how does God reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. What's the point? The point is, God always saves a remnant, but most of Israel was not saved. 7,000 at the time, the population was 2.5 million. That's one quarter of 1% were truly saved. We're going to see this when we get into Hebrews 3 and 4. They never repented. They never listened to the Mosaic policemen, which were the prophets. They never repented because they couldn't repent because they didn't have a heart to repent. What did they need? Verse chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, verse 6 uh, goes like this. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and that you may live. They couldn't follow Yahweh because they didn't have a heart to follow Yahweh. They needed a circumcised heart. How in the world were they going to get it? I'm glad you asked. Go back to Deuteronomy 17 and let's take a look at this. Deuteronomy 17 Moses prophesies that Israel's going to want a king. He says, Deuteronomy 17, verse 14, When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me, like the nations around me, good and bad. God wants him to have a king. He doesn't want him to be like the nations around me. That's Israel's desire. Verse 15, You may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose, Jump down to verse 18 and, and let's, let's get a description of this king. This is going to be a description of the prototypical perfect king. The king that Israel never is going to have until one. It goes like this, verse 18, And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it in all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, by keeping all the words of this law, the statutes, and by doing them. Okay, so Israel needs a king, right? Here's the prototypical king. The king's going to come. He's going to love the law. He's going to dwell on the law. He's going to read the law. He's going to do the law. Does this happen? Not right away. What do we see next in Israel's future? After they get into the promised land, ah, they're fallen right away. The sin of Achan, right? The battle of Ai, they lose because Achan takes some of the booty from the previous battle of Jericho. He wasn't supposed to do that. What's the point? They don't stop sinning even after they get in the promised land. The whole next generation, they're just like the previous generation. And uh, we get to the book of Judges. And what's the, what's the story of the book of Judges? Without a king, Israel, everyone in Israel did what was right in their own eyes. Right? So what do they need? Well, you know where we're going. They need a king. They need a king. So they're going to get a king. Turn to... Samuel, 1 Samuel 8, let's take a look at this. This is a great setup for all that we're going to see in the book of Hebrews. 1 Samuel, verse, uh, actually, 1 Samuel chapter 9. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just give you the, uh, the synopsis here. Israel wants a king. Samuel warns them, if you get a king... He is going to, this will be the ways of the king, he says. He will reign over you. He will take your sons. He will point them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. Char chariots rather. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields. He will take a tenth of your grain, etc., etc. He's warning them. He's saying, you're not going to want a king. But God knows best. So God gives them a king. 
he gives them their first king, and it's Saul. And he gives them a king that their lustful hearts want. He gives them the tall, good-looking king with the rich daddy. Let's take a look. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zer Zeror, son of Becherath, son of Aphia, a Benjaminite. Flares should be going off right now. A Benjaminite. Okay, we'll come back to that. A man of wealth. Okay, that's how they would pick their king. He had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. In fact, there was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Ah, isn't this great? Isn't this kind of how sinful people pick their king? Maybe even their president. Isn't that the way? God says, you want a king? You got him. I'll give you the rich king. He's going to be good looking. He's going to be tall. And he's going to be horrible. Right? In fact, Israel should have known better. Where does the king come from? What tribe? It comes from the tribe of Judah. Kings don't come from the tribe of Benjamin. Warning should have been going off at this time, right? In fact, if you remember in Judges 19, remember the story of the Levite and the concubine and how the people in Israel, the men in Israel, wanted to have their way with the Levite. Instead, he sends out his concubine, they have their way with her, in the morning he finds her dead, he cuts her up into 12 pieces and sends her to all the tribes of Israel. You say, what the heck is the point to that story? Here it is. Here it is. The men of Benjamin, in, in fact you could say the men of Israel, had become just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, do they need a king, right? They need a king. And they get one, and he's from the same tribe that did that horrible deed that was just like Sodom and Gomorrah. How does Saul's kingship go? It goes terrible. doesn't take him long, and he's rebelling against God. He's offering his own sacrifice, not waiting for Samuel. And what happens? God takes his Holy Spirit from him, gives him an evil spirit, and this sets up in motion the fact that we need a king. David comes, and he's kind of a good king, but not perfect. And Solomon comes, and he fails horribly. And then there's all of these kings, and the theme is the same. It's, there's never a good enough king. The bad kings were really bad, and they did something really bad. They caused Israel to sin. Even the good kings didn't tear down the high places. And even occasionally if there was a really good king and he tore down the high places and he didn't allow uh, idolatry, he still had a couple pesky problems. He had original sin and he had this pesky problem of dying. He couldn't live forever. So what's it all pointing to? They need a king who's going to live forever, who's going to love the law, who's never going to die, in fact, they need a king who's going to cause them not to sin. He's going to cause them to walk in his ways. Okay? The message of the prophets was Israel continually failed because she hadn't the heart to follow Yahweh. She hadn't the leaders to help her follow Yahweh. She needed one that would change her from the inside out. Real quick, let's look at Psalm 1. And then we'll land this, and then we'll move on in Hebrews. Psalm 1 goes like this. Blessed is the man. The man. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. On his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. Nah, but they are like chaff in the wind that, that the wind drives away. Before, therefore, the, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. 
For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Here it is. It's, it's, it's setting this up in Psalm number one, the very first Psalm. It's the first Psalm for a reason. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the way of sin, who delights in the law, who meditates on it day and night. Now, if you read this, there's a temptation to say, that's me. I'm that guy. But that's not you and it's not me. Remember Luke 24, the first video we did in Hebrews. Oh, foolish and slow to believe, Jesus says, all that the law and the prophets and the writings, the Psalms, said about me. Who's the blessed man? Jesus. Who's the perfect king? Deuteronomy 17. Jesus. What's the message of Hebrews 1? Long ago, at many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. What were the prophets all pointing to? Jesus. They needed a king. They needed a king who was going to change their heart because they could never follow Yahweh. They didn't have a heart to follow Yahweh. So, the, the, the author of Hebrews is shaking them silly by the lapel and slapping them upside the head and saying, Don't you remember? It was horrible. Don't do it. Don't be like them. Don't walk away because he's come. All of those types and shadows, they were pointing to this king and he's come. You never go back to the shadow when the real deal has come. And he's come. This king has come. And his name is Jesus, although they don't mention it in Hebrews 1. And he is the Son of God. In fact, he's going to do something remarkable. Remember the kings that caused Israel to sin? This king's going to do something remarkable. He's never going to die. He's never going to sin. He's never going to allow false worship. In fact... It says in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, this is what he's going to do. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all of your idols. All of them. No more idol worship, Israel. Not with this king. I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh, and here's the best part. Verse 27, And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and to be careful to obey my rules. Long ago, Hebrews, long ago, church in 2012, long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to the fathers through the prophets, but they never listened, and now he sent his son. Listen. Listen to him. Repent. Put your faith and trust in him. Don't go back under the law. Don't think animal sacrifices mean anything. Don't worry about circumcision. Don't worry about eating pork and lobster and shellfish and all that other nonsense. Those have all been done away with because once the perfect comes, the shadows, you don't go back to the shadows. He's come. That's the message of Hebrews 1, 1. And it sets the pace for the entire book. Don't turn away from Jesus. He's the only way of salvation. He's the only one who can change your heart and cause you to walk in his ways. Peace.